Hi, everyone. I'm going to take us up to a much, much different level to look at some of the concerns there are around the sort of development agency perspective. One of my daughters calls me a second-hand philanthropist because I spend your money, unlike Bill Gates, who spends his own. Um, but what I wanted to... <laughs> but what I want to do is, is give, a, give an idea of some of the debates that are going on at the moment with inside, inside DFID, not with a focus on research, but I can answer some questions on research later. Um, right, now it's not going. Try, yeah, that's okay. So in terms of um, the Department for International Development, the key objectives really of the whole department are around poverty reduction. And with the current government, the big focus is on economic development. And last year, we reached the milestone of 0.7% of gross national income, which is a UN target for developed countries <coughs> to spend on overseas development assistance. It's not yet <coughs> enshrined in law. We're not sure whether it will be enshrined in law during this particular government or not. But it was quite a, um, a task getting to 0.7 because we had been at around about 0.5 four or five years ago. We've heard a lot about the Millennium Development Goals, and these are really what have driven a lot of the work of DFID over the last 10 to 15 years. And as we've heard already, there are three of those which are focused on health. But looking at some uh, data that we've been looking at in the department, we've been looking at where are the poorest people and where is poverty the biggest problems. And clearly, it's... Um, highest rates of poverty are in low-income countries, concentrated where all the maps have been concentrated over the whole of this afternoon in sub-Saharan Africa and the Southeast Asia. And it doesn't matter really what sort of measures we look at, whether it's um, living uh, uh, less than $1.25 a day or maternal mortality, we've still got the same sorts of distributions. But actually, when you look at numbers, most poor people live in middle-income countries. And the government has a policy of withdrawing from supporting middle-income countries. And there's a lot of popular press reports about giving money to middle-income countries. But actually, when you look at it, that's where the poorest people are living. And those that are living in low-income countries are often living in fragile states. So what we also know is that Poverty number, people living in poverty, <coughs> excuse me, po people living in poverty will continue to fall. And that a large proportion of the reductions that we've seen have been due to China. But that in future, it's going to be India, which is really going to make a big difference as a number of people living in poverty falls. So really, poverty will be increasingly in sub-Saharan Africa, and it will be in quite a lot of fragile states. Um, so 98% of the extreme poverty is going to be in about 50 countries. And this graph shows the countries where poverty is falling, the countries where it's roughly remaining stable, and then in some countries where it seems to be increasing. And you'll notice that Nigeria, which actually is a middle-income country, is in, a, in that um, latter group. But we still will have most poor people continue to live in middle-income countries. And from a DFID perspective, these are the sorts of issues which um, we're looking at and thinking about how on earth do we m um, you, um, go through our poverty reduction processes and how do we make sure that countries themselves are thinking about how they reduce poverty. And some of you may have heard David Cameron has a, um, a phrase called the golden thread of poverty reduction, which includes these sorts of issues. But what's really noticeable, and it's what Sally said earlier, I think, health is more or less absent. Mm -hmm. And whenever you see people developing word clouds from documents coming out of the UN or high-level panels, the words health are tiny. Mm -hmm. Economic development is the big thing. AIDS often doesn't even appear on those word clouds. So neglected tropical diseases actually is appearing a little bit more frequently in some of those than, than AIDS because of the um, activity around the, um, the London Declaration. This is um, DFID's business model. 
or system of poverty reduction. And so different countries where DFID has offices are thinking about how does this work and how does their programs work in terms of this sort of business model. And as somebody who's responsible for about between 70 and 80 million pounds per year on health research, we have to find ways of saying how does our health research fit into this sort of structure so that we can align with the, with the business model. But you can see that there's an enormous focus on job creation, private sector, and um, countries actually sustaining their own poverty reduction through, um, th through the private sector. I don't think I need to make the arguments here about why health is important. We all know that if we invest in health, we will drive down poverty. And we know that protecting and maintaining health pre uh, prevents people from dropping into, po uh, into poverty. And we also know that if we address the um, improving health, when we're addressing some of the underlying causes of disease, and we've heard in all the other presentations today specific examples about how that, that might work. In the sorts of countries where we're working at the moment, there's clearly a high burden of infectious diseases, and our focus in DFID is very much on sub-Saharan Africa and some countries in Southeast Asia. But as we've seen all the way through, there's an increasing um, burden now on non-communicable diseases. And, and for a development agency, that causes real significant issues about how we deal with that, because the tendency is for us to work very much in silos lined up along the MDGs and for all of these things to be dropped in with health, whereas actually health alone can't deal with most of these things. So there's a real big issue about how do we deal with the underlying causes and the behaviour change, which also links up with what our colleagues who work on climate change and other areas of development also have to think about. So how do we find a structure that allows us to really address some of those issues in a way that is cross-sectoral? Because as a health sector, it's n we're not going to be able to address those, those issues ourselves. We've still got issues with the health um, and the focus on infectious diseases anyway. And there is this whole debate as we're thinking about what goes on in the future about sustaining the gains, which seems to be the new jargon. And everyone, every I don't know if you're hearing it too, but we're hearing it everywhere. We still know that most of the health spending is only targeting a smaller number of, of conditions and diseases uh, than we would like, and that much of what goes through aid isn't actually aligned with country priorities. We also know that aid flows can be quite volatile and donor priorities might not be the same as country priorities. And where a lot of development agencies are political organisations, they're plugged into national political processes, that means priorities can change very quickly. And um, we've, ha we've had a great focus for many years on, well, for the last five or so years on maternal health. What happens if that's no longer what's important? At the moment in the UK, with this particular government, we've got a great focus on malaria. Lots of different countries have got different focus. And as countries are reducing their aid flows, then some of the things which have been, fo been focused on in one particular country may suddenly drop off the agenda there. And the Netherlands, which was well above 0.7%, has been cut to 0.7% of GNI. And that's involved cutting quite a lot of their maternal and sexual reproductive health programs. So there are real issues in terms of continuity and sustainability of funding. There's also an issue of how much donors demand of the countries where the funding goes and how much we are really badly behaved because we don't line up properly behind what the countries want and how many different demands we place on those countries. And although we've got the Paris and the Accra agreements to try and be aligned, sometimes inside a donor agency can be very difficult to remind colleagues that actually we need to be aligned and we've got a lot of um, pressure coming from within the, the country to show particular results which may not be aligned with what other donors are doing. There are real tensions. This is just a diagram to show yeah. part of the problem and it just shows the multiple agencies and the multiple players 
pulling people in every which direction <coughs> rather than thinking about how we use that money most effectively. So in health, as in many of the sectors, there are significant problems. And I don't think it really matters whether we're talking about infectious diseases or non-communicable diseases. It's still a problem. We've got poor coordination and duplication. There can be very high transaction costs. As I've said before, often it's, there's very weak or absent country ownership. And there are real issues around whether the health system can cope, whether there's capacity in the system, whether there are enough staff, whether there are even any processes involved, and how on earth do we work in some of the situations that people have talked about today where we're far, far away from the capital city, far, far away from any hospital or community health facility. There's also a whole set of issues around accountability, which I want to come back to in, in, in a little while. Not only accountability, which as a, a donor you see because of the accountability of the funding flows from the donor country, but also, more importantly, the accountability actually in, in the country um, where you're spending the money. So we need to think about how we build the systems so that they work for the people that work there and support what's building capacity in the, in the country itself and for the country to be responsive to what's, what's required there. And we need to make sure that we have good responsible behaviours and that funding will follow those sorts of behaviours, which is easy to say and extremely difficult to do. And especially when politically there is a drive to think about how to invest best and in the private sector, how do you know that that's going to be the best way of investing your money? It may well be in many countries, but in some countries, actually government systems may be stronger and better. There's also a real focus on anti-corruption activities. And there is a UK act around fighting corruption in other countries as well. So that's all overlaid. And it's all part of the issue because there is definitely less of a support in the general population for development assistance than there was five years ago. And one of the first things people say is, oh, it's just going into a, a, a country and the leaders are sorting the money away in Switzerland. So there's a great deal of, of pressure on this sort of accountability. So we also need to think about how systems can be responsive to populations and make sure that they are actually implementing policies that meet the needs of the poorest. And I think that that, answer, that speaks to many of the points that people have made during the rest of this day, that um, lots of the issues and lots of the problems are around how on earth do we make sure that we do the right thing for the people at the time? And how do we meet, how, how do we find that bottom 10 or 20% who aren't being found by other means? And there's a whole set of issues around how do we increase accountability? How do we use the funding flows to be able to uh, increase the accountability on the ground? So that if people in a, in a particular district are saying, actually, we don't want this particular service, we want something else, how do we make sure that that happens and people can be responsive and accountable? I just wanted to then go on and talk a little bit about this high-level panel, which um, Sally showed us all about. And these are the sorts of underlying principles that are being thought about as the panel comes to its decision. They're very much about economic development and putting economic development at the heart of everything to do with development. And as Sally said, we've got potentially at the moment here, th this one is probably earlier than the one that you were showing with 12 potential goals, but only one of those being around health. So we've still a long way to go yet, and we still don't know quite where we'll end up and what will happen. So for us, thinking about how do we think about health in the future in the best way possible, these are the sorts of questions about how are we fitting health into economic development. We've had very clear messages from the, um, the ministers in, in, in the Department for International Development saying that they see human development as absolutely integral to economic development and it's a really important component. We need to think as well about the changing patterns of diseases including the reductions in, in infectious diseases 
but we need to think carefully as well about maternal health and, and how we address the issues there. As somebody said earlier, it's all very well knowing that we can prevent mother-to-child transmission of HIV, but if women don't come to antenatal care, we can't do anything about it. We need to think, as well as I said earlier, about lifestyle choices and behaviour change. And we, we've got loads of evidence that says, from research, people who've done interventions to try and change behaviour, and it increases knowledge and doesn't change behaviour. We still get people asking us to fund research to, yet again, increase knowledge. We need to think completely differently about how we're going to go about doing these sorts of things, and we need real innovation to think that through. We've got to think about some of the issues people have raised today as well about urbanisation and health system strengthening. And then finally, universal health coverage. What does that actually mean? How do we do it? Is it going to be a goal in its, right, in its own right? Is it going to be a, a target? And, and how are we going to think about that to make sure that we actually get real universal health care, not just those people we can reach? So those are some of the issues that we're grappling with at the moment.